All right, if you guys got your Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 15. Uh, Again, if you're new, we've been studying some parables of Jesus with the intent, the hope, is that we would begin to see more clearly the compassionate heart of God toward those who are far from him. There's this crazy statistic. The longer one becomes a Christian, the more isolated he or she becomes. The more they withdraw from those who don't know God. And so if as a church, we're going to continue to grow and we're going to grow healthy, then we need to understand the very heart of Jesus, the heart of God for those who are far from him. Jesus himself gave us his own personal purpose statement. He said, son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost. So anybody who claims to have the heart of Jesus must be about this himself. So here's where we're at. We've been in Luke chapter 15. And it's here that Jesus gives three parables about three things that are lost. Lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Now it's this third parable that stuns the audience. Jesus is saying some things that have never been heard before. There's never been a story told like this. Kind of simple, very rich, very deep, profound in its meaning. Now, it's important for us to understand what prompts these stories. Why does Jesus tell these stories? What is it that motivates him? It's not like Jesus just walked around and said, oh, hey, I have something to tell you. I just thought of a story. Something just came to my mind. No, these parables come in response to circumstances that are happening around Jesus, things that are being said and done. And it's the exact same with the parable that we hear that we'll read from this morning. Now, before we get into the text, I want, you to, I want to point your attention to the title of the sermon because I just want to tip my hand in advance. The title of the sermon is The Prodigal Sons, plural. Not prodigal son. This third parable is well known as the prodigal son. But there's actually more than one lost child in this, in this story. In the crowd, as Jesus is speaking, are those who believe they are so far from God, God could never reach them. All the things that I've done, all the things that I've said, the hurt, the pain, God could never reach someone like me. I'm just too far, I've removed myself too far. And then in the crowd you have those who believe that they're so good, God has to accept them. There's more than one prodigal in this story. Now, I'm a fan of ancient biblical art. And one of Rembrandt's masterpieces, perhaps the one he's he's known, he's most famous for, is actually titled The Return of the Prodigal Son. I'm going to show it to you. I mentioned this last week in brief. Rembrandt just had this way. He was the master at capturing light. And with light, he would draw your attention to the subject he wanted you to see, to the things he wanted you to focus on. And so, of course, the three main characters in the story are there. You see the father with his hands on the son. The son is clearly there. His head is shaved, which, by the way, that would be sort of the common haircut for a prisoner back in the day. He's missing a shoe. His clothes are torn, but you see the hands of the Father. I'm told that in art, the most difficult thing to draw are human hands, and there's this tenderness of the human hands as they touch the prodigal son. And then you see the face on the right of the older son. Now, you don't, Rembrandt is interesting because he doesn't give you the details of the prodigal's face at all. The, his face is just kind of hidden. It's shadowed. It's buried in the father's lap. But you see well the face of the father. He lights that, and you also see very well the face of the individual on the right, who is the older son. And he's just kind of standing there with this posture like, and he's at a distance. Rembrandt understood the depth of this parable. There is more than one lost son. There's actually two, the younger and the older. Now, for the context, as we did last week, context is king. Let's understand what it is that moves Jesus to tell these stories about what is lost and then found. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear what Jesus has to say. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes, these are the religious leaders, they started grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them, as we mentioned again last week. To eat with someone was a show of hospitality. It was to say, we're friends. So to the religious leaders, they're not having it. These people were unclean. They were impure. You had to get your junk together before you come to God. And Jesus is like, no, God accepts people right where they're at. And, and so, yes, these sinners and tax collectors are my friend. But he hears them grumbling. And he launches into these stories about what was lost and is now found. And each story ends in a specific way. It ends with a party. It ends with a celebration. Sheep is lost. It's found. There's rejoicing. Woman has 10 coins, loses one. She goes out, she's searching frantically. She's turning the house upside down. She finds the one coin. She celebrates, she rejoices. The prodigal son returns and there's a party. Here's the point Jesus is making. You religious leaders, your response to my work and what God is doing through me here is very different than heaven's response. Heaven is rejoicing at what's happening. And you're complaining and you're grumbling. I have a story for you. Verse 11. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And the father does it. He divides his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. I want to get out of here. I want to go away. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Jewish boy feeding pigs. That's pretty low. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise. I'll go to my father. And I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven. And I have sinned against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him. And he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf, kill it. We're going to eat. We're going to celebrate. For this, my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, What's, what does this mean? What's going on? And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But the older brother was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never even gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting for us to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother, your brother was dead and is alive he was lost, and now he's found. So the younger son comes to this dad, and he says, Dad, I want the life. Time for me to be the man. I want what's coming to me, and I want it now. Now, several commentators rightly note 
just how offensive this is. If you are listening to this parable, you're going, he did what? He did what? An inheritance wasn't received until dad died. So this is the equivalent of the son saying to his father, I want you dead. I want you dead so that what you have can be mine and I want it now. Uh, Have you ever been used by somebody? Was that somebody of a family member? No person on this planet will crush your heart like your kids. So there's an expectation on the part of the listener of what's coming next. Oh, oh, how is dad going to respond to this? We know. What did you say to me, son? You want what? Get out. Get out. Insult me like that. Get out. According to Jewish law, an offense like this was actually punishable by death. I mean, think about the brokenheartedness of the father. Having your child say to you, essentially you're in my life so I can use you, die, and give me my stuff. But something unexpected happens, right? Because the text tells us that dad does it. And by the way, this is going to take some time, thought, and effort on the part of the father to give the son what he's asking for. In verse 12, the son says, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. You know that word property? That's actually the Greek word bios, from which we get our English word biology. What is biology? Biology is the study of living things. He's saying, hey, Dad, give me my life. Give me my life. See, well, how does property come to be associated with life? It's very simple. Back in the day, your property, your land was everything. It was your social standing. You have land, you can feed your livestock. You have land, you can grow crops to feed your family, to sell. Your land was everything. Land was life. And so here's what dad has to do. He has to sell one-third of all that he has. It's not like he's going to reach into the safe and grab a stack of money and say, all right, this is, what, this is what's due you and your inheritance. Okay, all right. No, he has to take the time and the effort. And by the way, he has to suffer the personal insult and humiliation of making himself lower in everybody else's eyes. And he does it. This is an unheard of story. Uh, Most tremendous emotional pain here. If you've ever had a wayward child, you know exactly what this is feeling. It's the pain of rejection. And when it is human nature, when hurt, hurt back. And sometimes it can be very difficult to withhold hurt from a child who has hurt you. But there's this amazing thing that happens. This father maintains closeness with his child. And he does so at great personal offense and personal sacrifice. Everybody wants this sense that the light is always on and the door is always unlocked and there's always a seat at the table for me. Because if there's ever a heart change, it takes courage to come back. It takes courage to say, I was wrong. I am sorry. But you know what makes it a lot easier? When you know that you're going to be welcomed back. If you know you're going to be welcomed back, it makes it much easier to step into that space and to return. You don't think the father knows that. So the son does what young men do. He goes out. The older son said, he's going to go out. And he's going to have sex with the money. He's going to spend it on prostitutes. And apparently that's what happens. He 
he has nothing, nothing left. He blows through it. And then to make matters worse, a famine hits. So when a famine hits, the price of food goes up and you don't have any money to begin with, what are you going to do? What can you do? Hey, Jewish boy, I, got, I, I, I personally see this as somebody rubbing his face in it. Jewish boy, I got a job for the Jewish boy. Go feed those pigs. Right? Because to Jews, pigs were unclean animals. Go, go rub your face in it, boy. Feed them. And he does. And he's, he's this, this low point, this low point, and, he's, and the text says, he came to him himself. He came to himself. There's a, there's a moment of great self-awareness and honesty here. It's as if he says, what am I doing? <laughs> what have I become? What have I lost? What have I gained? What do I have? The pigs eat better than I do. I can relate to this. You know, there is a plottable trajectory to life. When you begin to pursue all those things that you think will bring you worldly pleasure, you know where you end up? What have I become? What have I become? Is this, is this who I really am? And what I've learned is that brokenness is beautiful. And what I've learned is that freedom is surrender. Because Jesus says, you want to find your life, lose it. Give it away. I, I gave it to you, now you give it back to me. You surrender it back to me, and then you're going to find it. So he's been trying to find it himself, and he's lost it. So the first step in turning back in repentance is dealing with reality. So eventually he regains his mind, develops a plan. Verse 18, I will arise, I'll go to my dad, and I'm going to say to him, Dad, I sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son, so can we, just, can we do this? Treat me as one of your hired servants. He's developing this real posture of humility here. Right? I mean, he's, caught, he's come low. He says, I just, Dad, can I just be a hired servant to you? Forget about being a son. I know the sonship thing is lost. Forget about that. I know I've ruined that. And you know, don't even treat me as a household servant. See, a household servant is different than a hired servant. A hired servant doesn't live in the house. A hired servant puts in a day's work. It's like a day laborer. Puts in a day's work and then goes back home. Has to feed himself. But a household servant has all the rights and privileges of one in the household. They're not worrying about their next meal. They're not worrying about where they're going to sleep. The owner of the house provides that for a household servant. So the son says, here, let's just do this. Just treat me like a hired laborer. I'll just come and go. Now, in saying this, there's a, there's a really profound principle. <laughs> this is why this, this parable is just so stunningly beautiful and so relevant for our time. The son has lost sight of his true identity. Remember that. So ancient rabbis believed that if you had this kind of offense, toward your family, according to law, the punishment was death. It was such an offense, the punishment was death. And at the very least, you could not come back into the household until you apologized and made full restitution and restored the family honor. But he develops a plan and he says, I want to come back as a hired servant. It, it's made much easier when there's an expectation Dad just might welcome me back. So in humility, he has his speech prepared. Okay, here's what I'm going to say. Here's how I'm going to say it. I'm going to look him in the eyes. Okay. And he starts down the road to home. And then the text takes another abrupt, abrupt turn. The text says that the dad sees his son far away. 
and he runs to meet him. Now, again, if you're a listener in the first century, just this little detail right here, the fact that the father runs to meet his son, is, it's shocking. Why? You realize that for an old man to run, it was considered undignified. Because at an old age, you shouldn't be in a hurry to get anywhere. You must not have your affairs in order. So if an old man is seen running, it's, it's kind of disgraceful. Plus, you're going to have to hike up your robe, right? You have to expose your legs and your... It's disgraceful. But he does it. He doesn't care. What he, in the same way that he doesn't, he, didn't, he doesn't care if other people see him as less than as he sells his property, takes a lower standing in the community, he doesn't care that people see him run toward his son. And by the way, there's every possibility that he's running toward his son in order to save him. He sees him way off, it says, because as that boy gets closer to the village, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. You could have people in that village that want to get revenge on behalf of that family. That boy's in trouble. So he runs to meet him while he's far off to save him. And then what happens? Oh, oh, Dad, okay, listen, here's the deal. I'm sorry. I sinned against you and I sinned against heaven. And bring the robe. Bring the robe. Bring the ring. Kill the fattened calf. My boy is back. We're going to party. I thought he was dead. He's alive. I thought he was lost. He's found. We're going to party. We're going to party. Now, do you understand what's happening here? When dad says, bring the robe and bring the ring, he's talking about the family robe and he's talking about the family ring. Son. Son. Not a hired servant. Not a household servant. It's my boy. And right now, he doesn't have the appearance as if he is my boy. Because you see, he's missing the family ring. Go get it. Put it on his finger. Those rags he's wearing, that's not representative of this family. Go get the family robe. Put it on him. This is my son. Identity. He had lost his identity. Now, I want you to listen carefully, please, to what I'm about to say next. In our time, in our world, in our culture, there is a tremendous amount of confusion. Confusion over gender, confusion over sexuality. What is my purpose? I'm trying to find myself. Who am I? Why am I here? The further you remove yourself from the Father, the more you will be confused over your true identity. I'm going to say that again. The further you remove yourself from your Father, your Heavenly Father, the more confused you will be over who you are and what you are. This is why there is so much confusion in our world today. Because people are moving away from the one who created them, designed them, gave them purpose and meaning in life. And so in many ways, like the prodigal son, they're out and, and the trajectory is predictable and they're trying to figure it out on their own and there's confusion. But when there's movement closer to the father, what happens? That true identity is restored. And dad says, this is my boy. Don't forget who you are. The light is always on. The door is always open. There's always a place for you. Scene one. Scene two. The son is out in the field. He's working, a little sweat on his brow. Starts to head back home. 
and he hears music, he hears dancing, he hears, he hears like, oh, man, it sounds like there's a party going on. <sighs> man, it smells like somebody's cooking some meat. You vegans and vegetarians will love to know that eating meat back in the day was a luxury. People didn't eat a lot of meat back then. But he's like, man, I smell something. I smell some meat cooking. This is a party. What's going on? So he goes back to the house, and he says to one of the servants, what's up? He says, hey, you haven't heard? Your brother, back. He's lost. He's found. And your dad's so happy. He said, kill the fattened calf. The fattened calf, the fat one, the good one, man. The one with all the, like, you know, meat that's marbleized. The fattened calf, the good stuff. Yeah, the best. What a great opportunity for the older brother to celebrate and rejoice, but his heart isn't in it. Why? The text tells you why in his response. The text tells explicitly he's angry. He's angry. And you... It's borne out by his response. He goes up to his dad and he says, look. Now, great way to start a conversation with somebody, right? That's a power play right there. Look. Notice what you've done. Look. I have been with you this whole time. I've been obedient to you. And you haven't even given me a goat. A goat was far less valuable than a fattened calf. You haven't given me even a goat to celebrate and party with my friends. But this son of yours, who squandered all that money, one third of all we own, dad, one third of all of it, he squandered all on prostitutes. You're going to kill the fatted calf for him? OK. Do you see what's happening here? The truth is, both the older son and the younger son were just using dad. The younger one did it through unrighteousness by being bad. But the older one did it by being good. I've been obedient to you. You owe me. You owe me. And the dad says, son, everything I have is yours. Everything that's left, it's all yours. Everything that's left is all yours. Two-thirds goes to the oldest son, one-third to the younger. All of this goes to you. It's your brother. He was lost, now he's found. It's only right that we do this. It's only right that we celebrate. How is the older son going to respond? Let's read. Oh, wait, it's not there. Why? Because the lesson has already been given. Everything Jesus, this is why this parable is so stunningly brilliant. It's just a work of art. It comes as a response to self-righteous religious people grumbling, complaining about Jesus reaching those who are far from God. And Jesus says, it's actually you. Pharisees, you're actually the older brother. You're just as far. Well, let me ask you, who's farther from God? The sinner, the one who knows what he's doing is wrong, or the self-righteous person who thinks that by virtue of their goodness, God is duty browned to welcome them home. There's something here for everybody. This is the fun part, right? Now it's your turn. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're like, to be honest with you, I'm the lost one. <laughs> well, I hope you're refreshed, and I, and I hope you see that, by the way, who's the Father? Who does the Father represent in the story? God. That God is there running, and there is nothing you could do that would prevent God from turning to you when you begin to turn toward him. The Father in this story is God. You say, well, what do I do? It's just simple. It's just come to your senses, right? Just deal with reality. What, where has this gotten me in life? What am I doing? That is the first step in repenting and being welcomed back into the family. 
And then there may be some here who are like, wow, I really have to be careful that I don't have an older brother heart in me. So let's just press in on this a little bit further because sometimes people with older brother hearts, they too identify themselves in all the wrong ways. They identify themselves with their good works or what they think are good works. Therefore, they identify themselves with their race, with their politics, with their gender. There are so many forms of false identity out there that lead us to that predictable trajectory. Meanwhile, we're moving further and further away from our true identity found in our Heavenly Father, sons and daughters. You find your identity there, you find your true meaning and purpose in life. So there's something in this one parable with just a few sentences for every single person on the planet. What is it for you? I told you at the beginning, my heart's desire as we work our way through these parables is simply this. If Illuminate Community Church is gonna grow, we're gonna grow healthy. And we grow healthy by adopting the heart of God toward those who are far from God. So last week, I said it, I'll say it again. Who is your one? Who is the one in your life that God has placed there? And you are on God's search and rescue team. What, that's an incredible amount of honor and dignity that he gives to you. And secondly, let's continue to pray that God would give us his heart for those who are far from him. So Father, that is our desire. God, I pray that as we leave this place, you would continue to draw all people to yourself, the good and the bad. And for those who are in the room that don't know you, God, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would move them, to come to their senses, drawing near to you, and help heaven celebrate, celebrate all that you're doing as your heart is affirmed when just even one turns around and heads back home. We ask it, we pray for it. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and God's people said, amen. amen.